Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. When we're defining a language, we need to define it both in space and time because all languages are exist in a continuum on both spectra. So, for example, the Romance languages, uh, which people can tell are fairly similar to one another, there is something of a continuum in space between varieties we might call Spanish and varieties we might call Portuguese, with some dialects kind of on the border. Although that kind of thing has become less so over time as the standard languages have influenced what people learn to speak. Same thing happens in Scandinavia, where there are dialects that are somewhat transitional between, say, Norwegian and Swedish. So where do we define the physical spatial boundaries of Old Norse? And then there's the, spa the, the temporal question, the time question. No one goes to bed speaking Old English and wakes up the next morning speaking Middle English, right? No mother who speaks Old English has a child who speaks Middle English. There's always going to be this, this shading between them. And the same is true at the beginning of Old Norse and the end of Old Norse. So in this video, which is a companion to a blog post that I'm making on Grimfrost blog about the same question, I just want to quickly review for you these questions about defining Old Norse in space and time. So the space question is somewhat easier with uh, an extinct language. Um, Old Norse does exist at the same time as some languages that are quite similar to it. Uh, Old English and Old Saxon on the continent are, and Old Frisian on the continent are very recognizably related to it. Gothic a little bit less so. Gothic's also a little bit of an earlier language stage, but you can still recognize um, something very like Old Norse if you understand that the uh, vowels that are present in unstressed syllables in Gothic are the same ones that used to be present in unstressed syllables in Old Norse and cause mutations in Old Norse. Um, Old High German with some extra consonant mutations that take place in that language is also recognizably close. But Old Norse is spoken uh, during the medieval era and the preceding Viking era in Scandinavia. Right, We're talking about Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and then places settled from there. So in the case of uh, Old Swedish varieties, we're going to see some Old Swedish speakers settling in parts of what's now Finland, Estonia, uh, even Russia, Ukraine. In the case of Old Danish speakers, they're going to be settling uh, in parts of what's now England and France. In the case of Old Norwegian speakers, they're going to be settling in Iceland and the Faroes and Greenland and attempting to settle in parts of Northeastern North America. Now there is some division between these varieties in the Old Norse period. Uh, we speak particularly of Old West Norse, that is Old Norwegian and dialects descended from it like Old Icelandic as distinct from Old East Norse, that is Old Swedish and Old Danish. I have a video that reviews some of the most important differences there. But these differences were fairly slight during the Viking Age and the medieval period. And so if you learn Old Norse, such as with my Old Norse Zoom class, which I'm currently about halfway through the spring semester of and probably going to start the summer semester of in May or June, so watch for announcements about that. We have to start with some spot in space, and so where I start is Old Icelandic. I don't think any instructor of Old Norse or textbook in Old Norse doesn't start with Old Icelandic because it is in Old Icelandic that the the, we have the most variety of literature and uh, also the vast, vast majority of vernacular literature that is literature written in Scandinavia that's not written in Latin during the Middle Ages. Um, learn Old Icelandic, learn to read that, and then you can approach, say, Old Swedish or um, older runic varieties of the language if you're interested in those having a basis in the uh, pretty complicated, let me warn you, grammar uh, of Old Norse, which is most, most approachable through Old Icelandic and all the interesting stuff there is to read in Old Icelandic. So let me give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimprost, uh, who again, making a post on their blog in association with this. I'll come back and talk about 
demarcating Old Norse in time. So in 2023, the oldest known inscription in runes was discovered. That is the Idiberg inscription from Norway. But that's not yet Old Norse. That's Proto-Norse or even Proto-Germanic. It's from the first century AD. There's a huge change that occurs in probably the 600s, 700s AD, where many unstressed syllables of the old language are lost, but the vowels from those syllables mutate the vowels that are in the stressed syllables that remain. So a good example of this, because it happens to English too, is, uh, is the root man, man, person, human being, or plural manis in the old language, the Proto-Norse language. But in Old Norse, that I has disappeared, but it has mutated the A into an E. This is a routine thing. So we get manis at some transitional point. And then eventually, because the information is already stored there in the stressed syllable, that unstressed syllable, falls out, it sort of atrophies and, and falls, and we get Old Norse men. So that loss of unstressed syllables with mutation of the preceding stressed syllables, called umlaut technically speaking, is the real dividing line that marks Old Norse off from the Proto-Norse period that precedes it. Some of the first texts that would be recognizably Old Norse then are written in runes and the Younger Futhark, or really actually in uh, transitional alphabet between the Elder and Younger Futhark, like on the Liba Cranium from Denmark, uh, presented some uh, new ideas about that inscription from Jackie Nordstrom in a video a couple years ago. Uh, another really early inscription would be the Ruk runestone, which is definitely Younger Futhark alphabet, but has some of those unstressed vowels still hanging on in the early 800s. But I would call those some of the earliest written evidence of what we can really call Old Norse. Where does Old Norse end? Well, the language is already trending toward change in, um, I mean, any, it, it, every generation language changes, but where has it changed enough that we can say this isn't really Old Norse anymore? It doesn't really happen in Iceland until probably the 1500s, where Alder Goldskogsen's New Testament in Icelandic marks a departure in style and vocabulary from Old Norse. We see a more dramatic change on the continent during the 1300s when the Black Death kills off so much of the population of Scandinavia. And probably that accelerated death in older generations is disrupting continuity with younger generation speech and maybe not necessarily causing more change, but causing more change to sort of last because you're losing the breaks in those older generations who are judging, you know, you whippersnappers for the change in the way that you talk. But again, the line is perforated between one stage of a language and another, right? You don't go to bed speaking Old Norse and wake up speaking, you know, like early modern Swedish. Uh, there's just no such uh, hard and fast dividing line, right? It could well be that with the advent of uh, AI and whatever, you know, maybe this changes the direction of English going forward. And so I'm speaking like a late version of whatever you want to call this stage, or an early version of whatever you want to call the next stage. Um, but from our perspective, there's been reasonable stability in English since like 1500s, 1600s, right? We can recognize Shakespeare as the same language, even if an earlier stage. Well, I hope that's been a halfway interesting look at this question for you, and I hope you'll check out that companion post on Grim Frost which will have been posted either just a little bit before or a little bit after this. And um, I hope you'll check out my books if you haven't yet, some of which are available in Grim Frost. It's a particularly convenient way to get them if you're in Europe. Uh, thanks to my supporters on Patreon and Ko-Fi who keep these free videos coming. Thanks to those taking my old Norse class now or in the future. And let me see if you can appreciate the situation I'm in here. I have never filmed a video deeper in snow. <laughs> I'm literally hip deep right now as I'm recording this. So anyway, again, thank you to uh, 
those of you out there supporting the channel one way or another and uh from beautiful very snowy colorado wishing you all the best